this might be called a long time handshake. <laughs> We have a rather interesting subject that might not be entirely appreciated from the titling, uh, but about 12, 40, or 50 years ago, Dr. Kilner of the Hospital Liverpool, England, began experimenting with means of making visible the magnetic fields of the human body and by extension of the planet. Dr. Kilner invented a screen which can be found and described in his book uh, The Human Atmosphere and this screen enabled him and any person without any clairvoyant ability to so affect the optic nerve that it was possible to see the magnetic field of the human body. <coughs> Experiments on this also were done by our our group many years ago, the days of the Church of the People, when Dr. Frederick Finch Strong made researches in this entire area. But the point of importance is that there is a magnetic field, that this field is related to the human being, and from it Kilner was able to diagnose a number of diseases and also distinguish immediately a pregnancy. As time went on, we more or less forgot the invisible atmosphere in which we exist. We should have been reminded of it by television. For over the years at this time, there are hundreds of different television channels in many countries, and these are all carefully separated in space, and in the magnetic field, each has its channel and its place, and this doesn't happen in a vacuum. We therefore know that there is something around us, something invisible, which has a very definite effect upon our existence and may cause life uh, in various degrees on the planet and destroy life if it is perverted or corrupted. The human being's vital or magnetic field is highly protective. It is an atmosphere, so-called, that surrounds the body about three feet from the surface and is radiated from within through certain centers, the heart, the brain, the generative system, and certain ductless glands. Uh, this magnetic field does not just simply exist there because of an, a vibration. It is a strong defensive instrument. It was given to the individual to protect himself against outside contaminations. While this magnetic field is active, normal, well adapted to the needs of the moment, the individual will be resistant to nearly all forms of bacteria, will find it possible to uh, be in contact with sickness without becoming sick, and is a great aid and help to certain nurses and physicians who must work in the areas of contagious ailments. This atmosphere is also not only physical, but it carries within itself a series of superphysical factors. For one thing, the, at this atmosphere is susceptible of improvement or decline. Uh, under proper training and thinking, constructive attitudes and so forth, this magnetic field becomes highly protective. If, however, it is corrupted by the individual himself, if he permits his negative attitudes to take over, if he misuses the powers and faculties with which he has been endowed, the field begins to deteriorate. And the more it deteriorates, the more likely the individual is to suffer from external conditions. <clears throat> this deterioration is not only physical but magnetic, also physical, etheric, and emotional, and may extend as far as the mental life of the person. The earth is similarly equipped. It has a strong magnetic field of its own, which at the present time is in a miserable state of disorder. This magnetic field is a kind of repository in which all the mistakes of mankind pile up together, and it forms a mass of disconnected, constricting, and uh, damaging vibratory rates. 
we know at the present time and notice that nature is becoming rebellious. We have not been willing up to the present time to assume that anything that we do can have any effect except to advance progress. But there are many things that we do that not only do not advance progress, but destroy it. And in this case, the magnetic field plays a very important part. At the present time, it is little better than a sewer as far as the planet is concerned. Into it has poured all the corruption with which we are now burdening our national international relationships. It is now contaminated by almost every thought and action of people. We have no longer any attitude of realization that effects follow causes or that there is anything in nature that can punish misdeeds. The old theologian laid all this to the God and the devil in constant conflict. Now we realize that it is a more simple problem, right and wrong, in constant conflict. Right builds up the vibratory rates of the body, results in conduct and action which assists and strengthens the vibratory rates of nature, and helps us all to grow, be happy, helps the flowers to bloom, and all these things, whereas a contamination of this field can result in everything that is detrimental and destructive. If we go back to the legendary history of the islands of Atlantis, we are reminded that according to the account preserved by Plato, uh, this continent was destroyed because of its corruption. It became a place of iniquities, disloyalties, evils, and excesses, and was wiped out in a single night. Uh, this has been considered as a legend, but at the same time it is obvious to us today that while we hope definitely that we're not going to be wiped out, it is about time for us to begin to clean up our planet and ourselves. This little planet is being burdened with much more difficulty than any honorable planet in the solar system can take care of. We look around us and we see six billion people breaking natural laws. Most of them do not even realize they're breaking laws because they do not even know there are any rules in the game. They feel that the individual can have anything he can get by any means that he can accomplish anything he wants to accomplish, even if it is by way of corruption. Therefore, the planet is becoming burdened with all kinds of mental and emotional corruptions. In addition to this, we have the physical misuse of energies. We see the great city rising up, and a great city is really a source of death. A great city is an area of land in which all natural vibrations are impaired, the ground under our feet is covered with concrete. The atmosphere up to the height of a building is corrupted by the very concrete these buildings are made of. And everything is done without any consideration of nature. There are no rules that we have yet discovered, or at least are willing to admit, by means of which it is possible to correct the increasing delinquencies of mankind. If we can receive radios of television signals on the opposite side of the earth and have, have programs go for tens of thousands of miles through what we call space, what happens when a nuclear weapon is discharged? Does this uh, explosion, because it is a few thousand miles away, they have no effect upon the magnetic field of the body of man or of nature? The real problem we are faced today, facing today is the corruption of nature. This corruption is the result of a continual program of self-centeredness, a constant advance of competition in all forms, and complete disregard for common sense. All these things add up to trouble, and we are now having this trouble, and we just can't understand why we have it. The materialist tries to assume that it is a natural accident, that it is inevitable. The theologian insists that it is the vengeance of God upon the unrighteous and the unworthy. But between these two is a very simple fact that is due to the pollution and corruption of the magnetic field of the planet, and by comparison, our own magnetic field. The human magnetic field surrounds the body with a kind of glow or haze 
extending about three feet in all directions beyond the body. It is first described by several ancient Platonists and Gnostics in their writings. The study of the mysterious human beings who live in bubbles. The magnetic field is a kind of auric bubble. It uh, contains the individual, it supports him, protects him, and provides his inner life with clothing necessary to its survival. It is the clothing of righteousness, the one-piece garment without a seam, and it is a very important thing for all of us. Now when we come to our own relationship with the other six billion that make up life here on the planet, we have the power to largely control most of the problems that arise in our personal environment if we will make proper use of the defensive mechanisms which nature itself has applied or given us to work with. Now out of all of this comes the realization that attitudes are the things that affect the magnetic field. And uh, researches that have been carried on show that all emotional distempers, all outbursts of anger, all ulterior motives, everything that is destructive is transformed into a rate of vibration and goes to work on the magnetic field. In other words, the field should be composed of certain magnetic colors, very clear, very bright, and very beautiful. But when a temper fit starts in, those colors change. Little by little, every attitude that we have forms a color pattern in the magnetic field. It also goes further than this into the auric bodies of the higher parts of ourselves, the emotional and mental. These corruptions show that the vibration is sick. Now, at the time of uh, temper fit, the individual probably doesn't think he's sick. He just hasn't got good control of himself. He's disturbed, he's annoyed, and he feels that someone deserves a calling out. Actually, however, everything that destroys the, lo the harmony of the magnetic field is bad for the person. It is not something that he can recover from completely just by getting over that spell of dispositional excess. It is something that will return every time he has certain negative attitudes. And those people have a chronic habit pattern by which they can be expected to have certain reactions periodically. These reactions destroy the individual's defenses. They make it difficult for the body to function because the magnetic field and the energies within the body which supply this magnetism are, are corrupted or disrupted in their proper functions. Almost any kind of excess can do this. One of the most terrible forms of this excess, of course, is narcotics addiction, by means of which we are able to see the complete disintegration of the invisible person just as surely as the visible one. And it is the disintegration of the invisible person that finally ends in the decline and decay of the physical body. All of the actions of the individual are subject to laws of cause and effect. And there is nothing that we do that doesn't cause something. And if there any, anything that causes something will have its effect. And the effect will be equal in every way in quality and in direction to the uh, cause which gave it being. Therefore, the individual with a little temper fit can cause a cyclone within himself that may take weeks of careful thought to remedy or restore. Now this means that there has to be some kind of a basic attitude that is useful. Now uh, I think we try to realize that the normal attitude of the human being is pleasant. The human being is intended to be a, a genteel creature, to have a good disposition, to be cooperative and neighborly, to hope for the best, to build for the future, and to in every way possible correct the evils that may lurk within his own disposition. In other words, the individual has to maintain a certain normal placidity or he begins to get sick. Now this sickness, because it is invisible to the physical eye and not necessarily immediately noticeable in the condition of the health, will go uncorrected and ignored. 
In fact, in many instances, will be used on purpose to advance a design or, pro or pattern that we wish to fulfill. Actually, however, the sickness starts with the first temper fit. And this first temper fit does do damage and leaves scars in the magnetic field of the human body. These scars accumulate in the course of time. The individual temp tendencies to a bad disposition are such that these dispositional peculiarities intensify, become built up, and as in the case of narcotics, we may say that the first dose is not habit forming, but the habit develops until it is uncontrollable. The same is true with a disposition. It starts with an occasional bad temper and gradually becomes chronic, and as it becomes chronic, we see the defense mechanisms of the magnetic field slowly sag, fade, and disappear. The, the, the magnetic field has to be maintained by a well-integrated and well-organized human being. A very large part of sickness, which is attributed to everything from bugs to uh, temperatures, is actually, part of this, is actually part of the mystery of the magnetic field. The individual's ailments very often begin with disposition and finally settle in the physical body. As the defenses against all kinds of outside situations develop, the power to resist these situations is lowered. Now it is also true of attitudes, habits which we develop in society. We have certain ways of doing things. These ways are not actually right, but we all use them. And as a result of that, we are gradually creating a disintegration of the magnetic vibration upon which we live, upon which we depend for life. All of this is very important to us today, where we have a world in which the human attitudes are really boiling over, where actually the effects of man's inhumanity to man is being expressed through physical phenomena. All kinds of disasters are now common, and in between the disasters we have wars. And the wars cause the disasters, and the disasters cause the war, and it is a vicious circle. But a war is nothing but a vibratory pattern out of control. It is some misuse that takes over. It is an abuse that becomes the norm. And out of this norm, of which is an abuse, comes a habit, and we say such evils are inevitable. They are not inevitable. They are only inevitable if we remain the same. If we continue to cause them, they will continue. When we cease causing them, they will cease. Now, how are we going to start in solving these for ourselves? Assuming for the moment that we're not going to be able, as individuals, to change the course of world history, we also have the problem that if enough people do unite in a constructive purpose, this forms a powerful field of magnetic availability. The magnetic field is improved by collective cooperation. And collective cooperation also begins with the individual. He must be part of a small but growing group of individuals who realize the seriousness of the present situation and realize that the greatest dangers we face are not on the battlefield, but in the, the depositories of energy, life, and consciousness uh, which belong both to the planet and to ourselves. The invisible corruption is more dangerous and more fatal than the visible. And the invisible is caused by the visible and reacts upon it and increases it until we are really in a serious situation. So let's see what we can do about this. We'll get to the subject particularly of the morning talk, and that is how can we become pleasant, harmonious, and reasonably happy people. Now, as we say reasonable happy, reasonably happy, because no one is going to be perfectly happy in this world. But we are going to do certain things because they are necessary. If we could watch through one of the Kilner screens and some other devices of a similar nature, we would see a placid person sitting surrounded by his magnetic field, his etheric double, his, his emotional body, and his mental body. And it would be a rather, he would be seen in a rainbow of full and clear vibratory rates, which the optical system will interpret as color. It can also, these can also be uh, interpreted as sounds. 
but the more likely as colors. As he's watching, he gets mad at someone. The uh, physical changes are slight. He may the corners of his mouth may go down a little, he clench his teeth or something of this nature, or let forth one of those great oaths by which uh, the individual expresses displeasure. But in the magnetic field, in the magnetic field, color changes immediately. As he says something that is unpleasant, he destroys a layer of self-defense. If he does it once, the, the scar tissue may heal up and very little happen. But if it becomes habitual, this becomes a distinct defect, a lasting and corrupting scar in our armament against inharmony and corruption. If, we, if the magnetic field is sufficiently disturbed, it affects our memory, it affects our will, our morals, our ethics, and our general practices. Little by little, we become accustomed to the fatigues of civilization. We believe that it is necessary for us to be tired and worried because that is the way the world is at the present time. But we might also note that various, very many things that we have today, many uh, forms of um, equipment which we now regard as indispensable, is actually a, a mistake. It is a false condition, and the, this false condition is definitely detrimental to the, wor the world's and Earth's and our own personal magnet magnetic fields. Uh, we are suffering not only from bad television, but from the magnetic field in which this is occurring, and the magnetic field in ourselves which is accepting it. We are now gradually subject to bad habits, it's just as much by bad habits as alcoholism or narcotics. The great city is a monument to bad habits. It is bad in almost every sense because it is unnatural, it is unrealistic, and unnecessary. But we call it progress. And to us, progress means to get into more and more trouble more and more often until practically the trouble becomes continuous. Then we know we are progressive. We are progressing in the wrong direction. We are progressing back to a disaster rather than forward to a success. Now, to fight this problem ourselves, we can only do certain things. And that, one of those things is to watch the harmony of the body and its functions. To realize that the body is an area of magnetic energy. And that this energy is subject to every kind of depletion that is possible to think of and also that it is also the source of the progress of the person towards a better and fuller life. The main thing is that nature, in its own form, and as we have received it in the beginning, is pleasant, right, purposeful, and according to the will of heaven and earth. Nature is forever a friend. It is always the source of growth and progress, and it is also an endless cause of beauty. But when we begin to misuse nature, then it gradually turns into a monster of unruly and horrible proportions. The nature abused becomes a source of tragedy for all concerned. And we have made no attempt to recognize that these difficulties lie in an invisible range that our physical perceptions cannot see. If we could see the, the natural corruption and disruption which we are causing, we would probably do something about it. But on the physical surface of things, we are aware only of trouble. And this trouble we do not trace to its real source. The trouble is always an enemy of some kind, but the enemy is usually ourselves. And this we do not want to accept because it interferes with what we term progress, which is the advantage, the individual himself. He does not mind or care what happens to others as long as he has his own way. All this adds up to a very sad, invisible world that is in getting into the same condition as the visible world. 
The only difference is that you cannot reform the invisible world by election. You cannot put new offices out there to run things. The only thing that will reform the invisible world is the correction of the mistake, to straighten out the corruption, and to return to the natural pattern which we were intended to live. Now, uh, there is a lot of evidence accumulating about this. We are beginning to worry about it. We are beginning to realize that there is some relationship between this constantly increasing load of disaster and the personal disasters which we are causing every day. We are becoming aware that nations cannot have falling out without something else falling out. We cannot continue to explore the mysteries of nuclear fission, putting off one explosion after another, without this definitely, permanently scarring the invisible side of our own planet, a side which we do not th think about, most people do not believe in. But something is happening which is gradually forcing us to recognize that there is some way in nature in which it can react to punish those that destroy its rules or impair its functions. And we are beginning to see this more and more clearly. Now, we are also told in the good book that when we are right, regardless of others, if we are right, there is a power that walks with us. If the individual is right, he will not be overturned or easily destroyed. The reason why he will continue and flourish when others do not is because this rightness is called in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress the armor of righteousness. The armor of righteousness is the magnetic field. It is that which defends us against not only the visible corruptions of nature, but the invisible pressures which are, surround us uh, in the world or the environment. But in order to get this protection, we have to begin to put our own personal lives into some kind of a natural pattern. We must begin to think beyond the very narrow uh, horizon of a short financial career surrounded by oblivion. We have to realize that we have laws governing everything, human relationships. Broken homes break laws. Uh, broken lives break laws. Broken hearts uh, break laws. And our own various doings and believings have a very powerful effect upon the continuity and survival of our human species, along with most of the other forms of nature which we are sadly burdening at this time. So if we start out, we can say to ourselves, if I wanted harmony, if I really wanted to be happy and pleasant, what would I do to get it? And what will I do? And it must be something that I can do without injuring others. If I injure anyone else trying to do it, I frustrate the whole pattern. Therefore, it is some way in which I can be happy without hurting anyone. I can be happy without stealing anything. I can be happy without corrupting anything. That happiness results from being able to enjoy the virtues of nature and life which with which we were endowed and which were given to us as a divine birthright. We were put here to make a beautiful garden. Not only have we allowed it to go to weed, but we have gradually corrupted it until it is becoming almost uninhabitable. This we must know, or we will follow in the way of old and ancient peoples, who, as the Hindus say in one of their sacred books, the great earth mother has shaken many civilizations from our back. And unless we want something to happen of that kind, we've got to correct ourselves, because nature will not allow us to fail. Therefore, when it gets to a vital point, a major correction is necessary, which will not be pleasant any more than punishing a wayward child is pleasant, but has to be. For in the long run, life has to survive, man has to grow, and the world has to unfold its potentials. Anything that hampers this long enough and continuously in intensifying will be met by nature 
with an appropriate disaster. So we have to think more or less of this. Now the physical body with its magnetic field is a very interesting and complicated situation. Not only is this magnetic field the source of health, but it is also the continual fountain of restoration and improvement. The magnetic field is, is essential to the mental growth of the human being. It is essential to the social adjustments of humanity. And it is also very, very essential to the personal and group living of families and things of this nature. Most incompatibility is basically in the magnetic fields. And if this capacity is, uh, is uh, too great, if this in uh, incompatibility is too great, uh, the magnetic fields will not permit uh, the, the union to be fruitful and they will have a childless home because with two magnetic fields in conflict there cannot be a fertilization of the ovum. So that uh, we have all kinds of factors to consider. But let's think for a moment how we could, each of us in our own way and with our own abilities, make things a little better. First of all, we can take disciplines. And disciplines come to us from almost all religions and that is one of the reasons why religions have been in trouble so long. The disciplines are against our pleasures. The discipline in which we are told to, to do right is, uh, is just too severe for us. We want to do what we feel like doing, and we will. And we rejoice in the fact that we've gotten away with it. We rejoice in the fact that we got what we wanted, even if hurt someone else. But we got it, and therefore this is a success, and the rest is forgotten. But the part that is forgotten is the major part of the problem, because anything that is a success that is not lawful is a failure. Somewhere along the line, it is going to add up to disaster. The individual is not ruled by ten commandments delivered from heaven. It is ruled by ten commandments built into the very structure of the world in which we live. The laws of existence are all according to the laws of life. Everything that happens is either legal or illegal. There is no compromise. And wherever we are legal, we grow. Wherever we are illegal, something bad happens. So it becomes a very definite part of our need, of our life, of our purpose, and our survival, that we begin to discipline our own lives. Now one of the disciplines that we can prove to be, ha to be helpful is the state of happiness. Happiness to us is to get what we want. Well, in nature it is to do what we should. The individual who wants to truly be happy must keep the rules of living. Otherwise, he may have a few days of glorious dissipation and then misery. It is perfectly proper to consider the fact that the person who is right will be happy. Now, to do that, he must cleanse his mind and his life from the causes of unhappiness and must get rid of the belief that his errors are the source of his happiness. He must begin to think back with nature into the rulerships of the various policies of existence. So we have in our own personal lives the uh, ability to clean house. And as we clean house, the magnetic field adjusts definitely. And uh, if Dr. Kilner was still alive, he would be able to probably tell us pretty much how much house cleaning each one has accomplished. This house cleaning has nothing to do with talking, unless that talking is expressing an inner conviction. Growth is not a discussion of growing, or an affirmation of growing. Growing is what it naturally is, the simple process of growing. And without the fact, there is nothing. So if we had in childhood, for instance, as many have, many difficulties which have scarred the life and may more or less damage the magnetic field, then our problem is to restore in every way possible the damage that has been done. We have therefore a complete science of medicine, medicine of, cult of character, 
medicine of correction of faults and health as a result of living well not living richly but living normally and having the willpower and the courage to accept what we do not understand now in order to do this we have to have some kind of a philosophy of life the individual is not going to do right just because it hurts he's not going to be right just because someone tells him he should be he has to have some kind of basic idea behind it all and as we advance in the sciences the scientists themselves to their great regret are beginning to realize this they begin to realize that they are not free agents to do what they please with natural forces and then be proud of each other and award medals for breaking natural laws this is something that we have to uh, finally discover and science is beginning to notice this just a little here and there but it is growing that science will never be science until it proves why we have to be right and when that happens then science will begin to be scientific up to that point it is completely theoretical and very largely conflicting but assuming that we are looking now for an answer we can begin by realizing that peace is the is one of the most vital things that we can possibly experience and peace is the is one thing that we are afraid of we are afraid that peace will interfere with profit we are afraid that peace will interfere with ambition or with some of the inner motives of our own nature but if we want to live and survive and to earn a better destiny than we have now we must begin to cultivate the quietude of constructive peace peace is not a waving of the flag or a parade peace is quietude based upon the realization of the purpose of nature it is the realization of what we should do and what we should be peace is freedom from illusion from deceit and from all the false fa and fallacies of life uh, peace is to be normal when you're at peace the, the heart works normally unless it's really worn out when you're at peace the circulation improves the digestion gets better the faculties begin to restore some of their strength and peace plus a normal pleasant simple way of life and a way with the thought is always to protect the normalcy uh, that we can not only have better health today but we can have a greater expectancy for longevity we, we we do not really wear out the bodies we let them rot out from indifference or from circumstances which we regard as inevitable well a few circumstances probably are inevitable but where they are inevitable and right they are so judged by nature but where they are not inevitable and are still perpetuated then they become dangerous interferences with the function of life if we want to the physical faults of man we know that when it's too high or too slow his health is not good but the magnetic field also has a pulse rate you can see it it flickers it is a, as though it is breathing in a great rhythm it seems as though that it has its own tone the Chinese call this tone the great coon because it represents the rhythm of the infinite and this is the rhythm that goes on forever and those who can tune into this rhythm also have greater extent of power and life and a greater future in life to come so this pulse of the nature if it is disturbed in man requires attention if this pulse is disturbed usually there is a disturbance factor which is either a can accumulative disease or else it is too much wear and tear or too much use of uh, destructive foods or elements actually the pulse of the great coon is the rhythm of nature and this is the rhythm the sages find this is where the old immortals gather in the mountains of the moon and sun to live together forever in wisdom and understanding the um, mountain tops of the future are related in a wonderful way to an invisible scenery 
which we cannot see. It is a qualitative scenery, a scenery in which beauty is the great predominant factor. If we are not beautiful, the scenery changes. And the scenery is what we call looking to the future. The individual inside himself feels in some way his adjustment with the scenery of his own attitudes. And as these attitudes become destructive, the scenery becomes distorted. If there is a great anger in him, the scenery breaks into a volcanic eruption. Nature has symbolic equivalents for all of the intemperances of man. And nature in, all, in the long run causes these intolerances and these mistakes to descend upon the human being in, in physical and recognizable form. But in the beginning, they're all invisible. And as long as we can keep them invisible, because we do not tempt them into existence objectively, we are much better off. Now, how do we be happy when things are there as they are today? The first thing is, if we have a proper understanding of life, we realize that the things that happen to us are all part of growth. They are part of the lessons that we must learn. They are what the Rosicrucians call the ABC Darian studies in the house of the Holy Spirit. Each of us has to win a certain amount of trouble, transform it, transmute it, redeem it, in order to grow. Now at the moment, growth by means of improvement is not popular. To say the idea is to avoid the pain but do not change the cause. This is ultimately impossible. Whatever we have caused will come upon us. Whatever we deserve will come too. Therefore, the beginning of our happiness is, deserve, is to deserve happiness. Now, to deserve happiness means a certain constant vigilance over ourselves. This was what they started the ancient system of yoga. For yoga was a discipline of the mind, a discipline of the life in which it became de dedicated and devoted to principles that are unchanging. A philosophy of life is necessary to give us those principles to make us realize the realities of life and the realities of understanding and existence. If we really believe in a God, if we really believe that the divine plan exists, if we really believe that this deity is benevolent and has its, its, as its primary intent the perfection that all, of all that lives, then it is a time for each of us to go into partnership with this procedure and join in the process of self-improvement. We like to think perhaps that we, our sins await forgiveness and that this forgiveness will wipe them away regardless of what we do as long as we belong to the right denomination. But this is not actually true and we all know it from experience. The narcotics addict comes to the same end whether he is an atheist or a theist if he continues the habit. So the problem is to get at these things from a basic standpoint and improve ourselves. So we can start with being happy. Now, we have moments of happiness. Very few people are unhappy all the time. Sometimes happiness consists of not having anything to worry about but no particular positive achievement. We just get along without too much concern. This may be considered uh, satisfactory, but it is one of those things that will not last. Every once in a while, this neutral state will burst out into something else. So happiness really means the gradual uh, transmutation, into term it in alchemy, of the base elements of human nature. All of our negative qualities will simply have to be transmuted now, this transmutation of these qualities is not difficult, although it becomes so if you inst insist on clinging to the mistakes. The transmutation of temperament is comparatively simple because all of nature is on your side when you try to do it. But if you are tempted away from it by ulterior motives, it can be very difficult, lengthy, and for many cases almost impossible. But actually in the daily life of life, of living as we go, you can get up in the morning, 
and you can say to yourself, this is another opportunity to grow. Or you can say to yourself, here's another mess. <laughs> it all depends on you. It depends on your own attitude. If you look forward to the day as an opportunity to prove that you are bigger now than you were yesterday in qualities and in attributes and in uh, accomplishments, it becomes chronic. If, however, you wait, wake up in the morning and you say this is a good day and begin to live that way, you will find that many of the evil negative factors will gradually disappear and you won't have to worry about them. They're gone. And you can meet each one of the experiences of life for what it is, a lesson. Now, in school, you're supposed to have a certain passing grade or you don't graduate. And in the problems of school of life, you either have to have a passing grade or you don't graduate. And if you don't graduate, you have to come back sometime and take the lesson again. So you might as well win in the first place because it is also going to be easier. Also, you will look over your worries and find out how valuable they are. Are you worrying about things that are no business of yours? Are you worrying about things in which the values are not worth the worry? Or are you worrying about the damage to some symbol in, of your own individuality? Are you afraid of loss, afraid of losing money, friends, family? Is fear the motivating principle behind all these actions that you're committing? If so, this is all wrong and you'll get into more trouble as you go along. Start the day with a realization that every opportunity of that day is going to be to help you to be better. That when that phone call comes, answer it without fear or objection. If there is difficulty in the office, face it. If there's disaster threatening in the home life, do everything possible to make sure that there is no part of that difficulty due to any attitude or reaction of yourself. Everywhere, work for normalcy. Work to achieve a state that you wake up with a smile and you go to bed with a smile. And that during the day you have not closed your mind and merely laughed by not thinking, but you have closed, opened your mind to the values of the things you have feared and worried about. A problem exists to be solved, not to be worried about. And if a worry is all we can give it, all we do is to destroy our own health. Also, all these mental and emotional attitudes do react upon the physical body. They react in lowering the function of the body. Now, as the physical body and its glandular structure are the sources of the magnetic field, the more the body is abused, the weaker the field becomes until it is no longer able to protect us and we can have great trouble from some slight cause. Always there's this great problem that wherever individually or collectively we disobey the law, something is going to happen. And the only answer is to get back on the track and stay there until the problem is solved. To do this, you will also find very much improvement in health. You will find that you do not have nearly the needs for some health support. You will find that your doctor's bills will become less when you do more constructive thinking for yourself. This does not mean that just constructive thinking can take away a pain. This is not what we're trying to say. But with constructive thinking can remove the cause which is manifested as pain. And very often these pains are of psychosomatic origin. The individual who is troubled all the time is sick all the time. And if they are not physically sick, they're mentally and emotionally ill. The only way to be happy, healthy, and contemporary is to face each problem head on. Solve it to the very best of your ability and be able to solve it upon the background of a philosophy of life that is adequate. Now we can say to uh, people, how do we know there is a philosophy of life? A lot of people deny it. They say that all this is superstition. 
that if there is any moral code, it is because some small group wants to impoverish us, that we are actually free agents. But then we are not free agents unless we are free of the delinquencies which impair judgment and integrity. I think the first thing that we have to realize is that wisdom is simply the internal function of the mind. Now, if you're looking at the magnetic field of the mental body, you will see that it is stratified and it's also a constant flickering of light through it. If uh, the mental attitude and the con concept held is right, these colors remain clean. If we attribute to mind things that are not right, which are not really or oriental, oriented, then these colors begin to fade, change, become dull, negative, and then we say we are a pessimist. That these things are all part of one tied in structure of processes. Therefore, we can tell pretty well by the individual whether there is a God or not. The individual who is living well, doing the job well, has a happier personal existence, is being rewarded, if not directly by God, then directly by the laws which deity has established. There is no doubt that we live in a universe of laws that cannot be broken without suffering to ourselves. This is true of nations. Every nation has a national entity it might be a called a collective person. Every nation, every uh, person from another country has a part of that country built into his psychological integration. It is a racial factor, it is a national political factor, and it is a, very often a physical structural factor by which this individual is differentiated from others. Over each of these complete groups, there is a racial, cultural entity. There is a compound vibratory pattern, a vibration, a, and a magnetic field of that particular race. Uh, they, these races, therefore, become entities in themselves, made up of millions or thousands of individuals. These races have their, also their destinies. And uh, these destinies are very often afflicted. Sometimes these destinies, as a result of long neglect, are bad. But now we find that most of these destinies are being broken up, and these groups are mingling with others and gradually achieving a more normal relationship with total humanity. This is true of religion. Each religion is a, an entity. It has its own vibratory rate. It has its own function. It has its own followers and adherents, and it has its own right of survival. Each individual with his religion affects his magnetic field. Every religion affects the color of the auras of the emotional and mental bodies also. Our religion, therefore, becomes part of a kind of medication, an invisible medicine, which keeps the invisible part of ourselves in reasonable health. It is a kind of invisible tonic, something that is necessary. If therefore we break our own religious beliefs or damage them, then no other religious belief can really help us until we have mended our own. We cannot walk out any more than we can walk out of the race or nation to which we belong. All these things are part of a vast vibratory structure which you can go on and allow and align with practically every attitude, belief, and conviction of human beings. It is this, that, therefore, that is the basis of growth and the basis of the necessary corrections that we face today. We are coming very close to a major division in time. I think we are reaching a point where the pressures of our own mistakes are becoming intolerable. It's just exactly like the individual who becomes an alcoholic. He reaches finally the state in which he becomes obsessed with peculiar beliefs and entities and delirium tremens sets in. And when that sets in, the individual lives in a world of delusions. Well, in a sense, 
this type of delirium has already set in with humanity. We're living in a world of illusions. We're living in a world which we believe we can control, but we have never made any effort to actually control. The only thing we have tried to do is adapt this world and this conglomerate we belong to to our personal desires. We want it to serve us, preferably at the expense of others. Sometimes we do not say preferably at the expense of others, but the things we want would be impossible unless we damage someone else. And all this is taken into consideration by nature. Animals have their group entities, and these group entities teach them the morality of existence. Animals follow their own laws, and follow them exactly. And if they differ from them in, for, in even little way, the animal's life is threatened. An animal cannot be anything except harmonious with the pattern of itself, or it will perish. And the animal teaches, the mother teaches the young by example. A great wisdom is transmitted without a word. A word the wisdom is example. How to do it and survive. These creatures, all as the Buddhists have pointed out, have their spiritual leaders, sages and saints invisible to us, who have taken on the burden of taking care of the little brothers, taking care of the little ones, that are not yet wise enough to take care of themselves, whose bodies and nervous structures are not sufficiently attenuated or sufficiently coordinated to permit the entrance of an individual entity. <clears throat> These things have to come with time. But everything works for harmony. Everything must harmonize with everything else. We will never really have a religion until all religions harmonize. It isn't necessary that we all believe alike, but it's necessary that what we do believe is right <coughs> and for the good of all. Then we can go on with other things of the same thing. Music is another entity. Art is an entity. These things are magnetic patterns by means of which beauty and uh, harmony are perpetuated. Pythagoras pointed out and others after him that every musical note has its adjustment with the universal pattern. Everything is one great plan, one great harmonious, happy unity, except man will not permit it to do this. He insists on endangering it. He insists on damaging a beautiful necessity in order to achieve some cheap success of his own. So as we come in time now to the end of this century, <clears throat> the time has come for a more or less careful estimation of what's going to happen. That we are not going to be wiped out, but we are going to be forced to reconsider action which is obviously wrong. The more rapidly we accept this and the more quickly we correct our mistakes, the easier these transitions are going to be. We will not have to suffer some horrible disaster if each of us as an individual that really tries to improve the allotment which was given to us in the beginning. Each of us has a certain magnetic keynote, a certain value, and if we live up to that value, we are safe. If we disrupt that value and fall below its level, we are in danger. And in danger we remain until we correct ourselves. Now, you know you're correcting yourself when you begin to feel good about things. When you say to yourself, all these things are working together for good. If you can begin to see the lesson in each problem, and by seeing the lesson, dissipate the problem. By watching for opportunities to learn more about the life in which we exist. To gain greater sharing in life. Realizing the value of unselfishness as against selfishness. The value of peace as against conflict. All these things we learn. Children can learn them. It is time for education to teach us that the purpose of life is to grow and improve. 
that the great work of life is not to be measured in a career here, but in an unfoldment of the basic character of the individual. Someday we may have a motor or a computer or something which can estimate the actual moral growth of human beings. They will find some way to measure whether the person is getting better or not. We have all kinds of medical devices now to diagnose ailments and in many cases to correct, to correct them. But we need a still greater instrument by which we can diagnose motives, by means of which we can look inside of the individual or individual's activities and find why he does what he does. And if in do, so doing we find that the answer to that what is selfishness, self-interest, and... Uh, more or less competitive thinking, then that machine will tell us we're in danger. If, however, in checking it, we find that the person is kind, generous, gentle, non-offensive, very, very low and slow to develop any antagonisms, and if any exist, to correct them immediately. Very, very quick to forgive, and very quick, if not to forget, at least to transmute the thought from a problem to a form of growth. We are here to transform every action of life into some expression of becoming better. We are here to grow from whatever beginnings we had. Some have come with a considerable allotment which they have earned in previous embodiments. Some do not have quite so much allotment but they all have infinite opportunity to grow. And this is the reason for life. Our schools should be teaching growth, teaching young people to become better, more useful, and finally happier. Because happiness is to keep the rules. And if you keep them perfectly, you're going to have a perfectly happy life. We're probably not going to be quite that good at this particular time, but we can improve. We can reduce our unhappiness 50 or 75 percent in a year or two if we do some constructive thinking and also apply that thinking to the correction of mistakes in the personality. We can finally estimate our own natures. We can see what the dangers are. We can realize where the shortcomings are important. And in this way, by self-analysis, restore equilibrium. And by doing that, and restore happiness. Happiness is normalcy. It's not being average, it's being normal. Happiness is the individual doing what he is supposed to do with a full understanding of why. And while he may not at this stage have that full understanding, he can through religion and philosophy anticipate its probabilities. There are very few people in any civilized nation who do not understand honesty and integrity but they do not believe that it is valuable they say to themselves in a short time I'm going to be gone and I might as well make all I can while I'm here well that might be all right if there was no place where we're going but that is not sure either and it's better to be on the safe side just in case and if we do survive then all that is good will be added to our allotment and that which is wrong will be set up for further correction. We live in a world of correction which will continue to correct until there's no defect that needs correction. And this applies to individuals and to nations. We are going to have all kinds of dismal occurrences until we begin to live the principles which we all know to be true. Of the six billion people we now have in the, in the world approximately, probably four billion of those people are religious. They believe in some kind of a God. They believe in some kind of a golden rule. They believe in a some kind of a table of commandments. They all have the same basic concept, and that is refrain from evil, practice the good, and continue uh, to hope for the future. If therefore we all have this in common, why is it not obvious? Why do people in the name of religion murder each other? Yet they have been doing so from the beginning of time. And they have bred nothing but war, disaster, difficulty, and death. 
even today sorrow is being generated all over the world by fanaticism, self-interest, selfishness and these things and what are they? they are simply the extreme examples of a system which is wrong from the beginning this is the final fruit of wrong thinking, wrong living and wrong believing therefore if it has to be changed we have no right to continue to believe that we can break the rules of friendship, kindness and uh, society with impunity simply because we hate somebody or we're trying to take his country away from him all these things are outside of the divine plan now a lot of people don't want to believe in a divine plan but many of them are gradually being converted being converted principally by the fact that they can't live by the beliefs they now have they cannot survive they become hopelessly bogged down and there are a great many people today who commit suicide simply because they can't live with their own concept of life and it's not necessary for them to get out of here it's only necessary for them to change their own concept to get nearer to the facts of things to have a life that is real to have a life that is founded in truth instead of in selfishness and personal aggrandizement so we uh, know that uh, we are working with a chemistry not only a visible chemistry but an invisible chemistry that we're working in a universe every part of which is alive and everything that lives is ruled by the laws of life by the rules of living and by the tremendous archetypal plan which we can hardly conceive of that governs and regulates the conduct of every living thing also that even the most so-called inanimate objects have their magnetisms have their possibilities of communication and things that we don't believe at all have also proven to be very valuable medicinally something that we can't understand as a living thing can become a remedy for an ailment in a living thing and that is because the thing itself is living only we didn't know it so everywhere there's a great alchemy and great chemistry going on and every once in a while we have to have proof of this so we have proved it down through the ages usually by sorrow usually the proof has come in some form of disaster therefore it is very more important now to try to avoid disasters to try to make any further disaster unnecessary because we have opened our eyes and seen the truth the truth for each of us is the same be kind and be happy do good and be happy be unselfish and be happy and the all things love each other and be happy and carry no ill will and nearly carry no good flattery and no lies about each other always doing what is right and being happy because we've done it that way for the moment we do something where we regret or will regret we are, being, we are disturbing the harmony of nature and this harmony is so exact that we have a funny little statement that nobody's ever made much out of and that is that God is aware of every sparrow's fall and this is probably quite literally true because every little incident that occurs feeds this great reservoir of energy and is a permanent part of an archetype that is developing and everything that is uh, unfinished business will have to be finished and there is no person no matter how humble or how apparently neglected they are whose problems projects and solutions do not exist they are all part of a plan there is no thing alive or living anywhere in the universe that is not under law and this law has only one purpose the perfection of all that lives and with that realization and that to constantly in our minds I think we can increase our participation in happiness comfort pleasure and joy there's an old fable you probably know about the Indian Emperor who was grieving over the death of his wife nothing he was irreconcilable and finally the soothsayer told him he said 
the only way you will get over this terrible grief is to wear for one day the shirt of a happy man. So the Vizars sent out messengers all over the country. And at last, after a long time, one of the messengers returned and said, Lord, I have found the happy man, but he doesn't have a shirt. <laughs> this is uh, the type of thing that we gain from ancient proverbs and so forth, but there's a lot in them. We want to be all that we should be, but to do that, great pressures must subside. We have gone about as far in the creation of billionaires as we can go. There's not much more that we can pay our athletes with all everybody going broke. <laughs> Their stocks have tumbled down very notably in the last few days, and everywhere excess is burying itself. Everywhere the, the situations that have been built up by fallacy and selfishness are falling apart. We are looking now for likely candidates for future presidents and are having great difficulties finding them. <laughs> because we have not produced them, we have compromised everything. We have made compromise a way of life. And the individual who accuses another person of compromising has probably compromised also. It is just a case of using it when it's advantageous and forgetting it when it isn't. But all of these things show that we are having a decline which has to be corrected. And probably the great correction will not come from the top, but will come from a world, a citizenry that has been under these pressures for a long time and is now ready to accept and support a better way of life. When this occurs, then the laws of life will be very happy. The magnetic fields will be bouncing around with pleasure. And we will all be much healthier, happier, and more informed. We will find the joys of things that are not based upon finance. We will find the realities of things within ourselves rather than any accumulation out of outward articles of one kind and another. We will no longer be searching desperately for wealth, which itself is one of the major forms of disaster, but we will be more interested in the cultural life of the race. We will be more interested in having a good home than having a great business. We will be much wealthier because we have the love of those around us rather than more money in the bank. Debt and all these things are part of a fallacy, a fallacy that is no longer necessary. And that fallacy doesn't have to be really... Um, have God point his finger right at it or something. We don't have to say, wait to hear the thunderous voice of heaven because the, the God in us is the one that's going to give us the news. And that God in us is going to do it by the destruction of the vibratory facts and defenses that we have. When we break the laws of our own way of life, we will begin to define the magnetic fields disturbed, sickening, and while you can see them, uh, but you will feel them. You will know that something is going wrong, and little by little, these neglected fields will convey themselves to the body where they will break down physical functions and deplete physical organs and make the survival of life impossible. So we start by keeping the rules and then the rules will keep us. And if we keep the rules and they keep us, we can be happy. We can be happy with the realization that at last we have found a security based upon the, our own integrity, which is the only honesty that can be in nature. We cannot depend on someone else to save us. We must we achieve our own redemption through the practice of the principles of good. And if we do that, each day we'll be a little more pleasant, a little happier, our friends will be better, and if we run across a situation that is disagreeable, we will find some gentle way of solving it, of solving problems without temper pits, without turning away from people we've known for years. All these things are foolish. The only thing that is necessary is to maintain a natural regard for life. 
we think of deity as something that loves loves everything and we are most like God when we begin to love everything that is well, lovable or right and that which is not lovable or not right becomes our pro a problem for us to help to solve for everything that is necessary for man man can solve by cooperation with himself and when he cooperates completely with himself he is fulfilling the law of God in his own life so we have all these things to think about and I think we should realize that we can have a much happier life by beginning to live it in a constructive way and that this there's no escape because there's inside of us this invisible energy field and when we pervert it it punishes us and this is something we can't talk ourselves out of nobody else can get it away from us and no other person can change that magnetic field except ourselves we can't have it corrected by somebody else if there's a correction from the outside it may give a temporary relief but gradually the old patterns close off and the individual goes back to the problem the only way he can get away from the problem permanently is when he solves it for himself it's the only way to be healthy is to be healthy yourself no one else can bestow this upon you and so in one way or another we're all trying to do something worthwhile and we believe that even if it doesn't solve every, everything immediately that if we are a little happier about the way we live and a little happier about other people and very glad to see the success of others all these things will help us to be better healthier wiser people and make have new friendships and we'll learn to understand the inside parts of ourselves well thank you very much